This is South Africa, two million years ago. The world of Tang Child. And just like the savanna today, food is scarce. There are no easy pickings. This is Tong's mother. At a little over three feet tall and just 75 pounds, she's no hunter, but supplements her diet by scavenging from the scraps left by predators. Like a modern chimp, she uses rocks as a basic implement to break open bones for their rich marrow protein. But the predators she owes her free lunch to are never far away. You've got saber-toothed cats, you've got giant hyenas, you've got hunting hyenas, a whole plethora of carnivores, very dangerous carnivores that we don't have anymore. And they would have all been eating or going after things like the Tong child or even uh, Tong's mother. Absorbed by the remains of a carcass, the mother has placed her child a short distance away in the shade of a tree. Her three-year-old is the size of an 18-month human infant and has no protection apart from its mother. She knows there are threats, but she's keeping one eye out for the child, like any parent would. They definitely would have cared for their children. I mean, you see chimpanzees as the most caring of parents. There's no reason to say that Tong wasn't cared for. The problem with the Tong child was it's probably just old enough and rambunctious enough that it was leaving its mother for stretches at a time. The mother is unaware her baby's wandered away until it's too late. There's no sight or smell of a predator in the undergrowth, but predators don't just exist on the ground. You've also got a threat from eagles. They've been documented to take human children up in Kenya to the age of six years of age. I mean, an eagle has a, these incredibly strong talons, greater, uh, it's a lovely foot, greater lift to weight ratio than an F-15 fighter jet. The child is unaware of the danger from above. The mother sees the eagle and the child in the same moment. can't get to her baby quick enough. <laughs> Tang's skull was found with eggshells and other broken skulls, typical of deposits found in eagle nests. A lot of the skulls, interestingly, have these V-shaped impressions from this eagle's beak going through because preferentially they eat out the brain, very rich, nutritious source of protein. This small, defenseless creature is Raymond Dart's missing link. Valentine's Day, 1925, just two months after Tang Child first emerged from the rock. A week ago, Dart published a scientific paper claiming Tong as the missing link and unleashing a storm of controversy. Dart thinks he's got the missing link, but there's also this Piltdown specimen that matches what the scientific establishment thinks. Brain growth was thought to have driven human evolution and Piltdown had a large brain and ape-like teeth. But Tong had the opposite, a small brain and human-looking teeth. The whole mix of different features that you find with the Tong child really is quite interesting. It's a whole reversal. It's more like an, a man-ape than an ape-man. And it's a complete different mix of features that the world hadn't seen and the world actually wasn't ready for. Have you seen Professor Dart? The biggest experts in this field all backed Piltdown. Any sort of voices of doubt were generally uh, just overridden by the authority of these people. Dart's publication directly contradicts the scientific establishment. 
Does anybody tell me where I can find Professor Dart? He sent it to London to be reviewed by the world experts. The same experts whose views he contradicts. And these so-called experts dismiss it because they've got their money on the other horse. He has one ally in his struggle for recognition. Dr. Robert Broom, like Dart, an anatomist and fossil collector. Broom has the reviews from London. Raymond, ah. Raymond I, I thought you'd be interested in these. Some responses to your short paper in Nature. There's one there by Sir Arthur Keith. What does he have to say? Not very encouraging, I'm afraid. He places Tau in the same subfamily as gorillas. What? How? Well, he says here, the brain is clearly too small to be a human ancestor. The experts line up to condemn Dart's description of a fossil they've never seen. How can he know what's too small or too big? <laughs> How can he possibly claim that a human ancestor's brain had to be a particular size. What's his yardstick? A, a standard size bowler hat? What's, what's the matter with it, Robert? Do they think I'm making it up? So what went wrong for Raymond Dart? Wrong man, wrong place, wrong thing. He's the wrong man. He's an Australian. He's not part of the establishment. It's the wrong place. Southern Africa. Everyone's expecting another place, either Europe or Asia. It's the wrong thing. He calls it an ape. Everyone thinks it's an ape. Well, if it's an ape, where, is, where does it fit in the story? Tao is showing so many points of affinity with the gorilla and the chimpanzee that there cannot be a moment's hesitation in placing the fossil in this living group. How can he say that? I don't know. Smith Woodward dismisses the whole thing out of hand. He says that Town certainly has... Sorry, old man. Dart has made probably one of the most remarkable discoveries of the 20th century, and the scientific establishment completely discounts it, discredits his find, and literally puts it in a box or suspense account for 25 years. In the 1920s and 30s, the most widely read textbook on human origins does not even mention Dart's find. His work is not taught in universities. Dart had suffered an incredible amount. I mean, Dart was really put in kind of scientific obscurity. And it really is not until the late 40s that he starts again, once that tide of opinion starts to turn and shows that he was actually correct. It takes a quarter of a century of digging in South Africa's limestone caves to produce the evidence Dart needs. But by the late 1940s, a dozen fossils similar to Tongchild finally prove he was right. So what has become of Charles Dawson and his Piltdown Man? Forty years after it emerged as the prime contender for the missing link, the Piltdown fossils are examined scientifically for the first time, and finally revealed for what they always were, an elaborate hoax. There was embarrassment and puzzlement, uh, astonishment, disbelief in some cases, that this thing was not genuine. But I think for the greater world of science, uh, there was relief, particularly outside of Britain, because so many people by then had decided there was something peculiar about Pildown, even if they couldn't put their finger on it. At the Natural History Museum in London, scientists decide to apply some newly available chemical tests. But as soon as a sample is drilled from the jawbone, they notice something strange. a distinct smell of burnt flesh. This can only come from organic bone, not fossil. So the jaw cannot be more than a few thousand years old. 
and clear marks can be seen on the surface of the teeth, scratch marks. Originally from a modern ape, they've been filed down to look human. The entire assemblage, stained to look old, is a forgery. It is never proven who the fraudster is. But with the demise of Piltdown, an old idea dies with it. That a big brain was the defining factor in the missing link. Something else had to come before the evolution of a big brain. So now, a new theory replaces the old. What defined the beginning of humanity was not brain growth, it was using tools. Somewhere in Africa lay the fossils of our first tool-making ancestor. And by the late 1950s, one man was on the verge of finding it. It is 1915, and a young boy named Louis Leakey is looking for stone tools near his missionary home. It's the beginning of a lifelong obsession that will lead Leakey to revolutionize the entire story of human origins. Forty-four years later, Leakey is looking for the missing link and the search has taken him to what is now Tanzania. Leakey has persuaded the scientific world to see the missing link as the first human ancestor to make tools. Now, all he has to do is find it. He's supported by his second wife, Mary, with her son, Jonathan, who's just out of school. Got something, boy. They've found plenty of stone tools, but so far, no sign of Leakey's toolmaker. And he's been looking here for 22 years. His luck must change soon. July 17th, 1959, finds Louis Leakey laid low with the flu. Major work at the dig site has slowed while he recovers. And though it may not feel like it, it's a day that will make his career. In the cool of the early morning, Mary takes the chance to walk her dogs and heads away from the camp. She isn't expecting to find much in the way of fossils, but this year's rains have done them an unexpected favor. As she casually scans the broken surface, her mind suddenly registers an unmistakable shape exposed in the dirt. It's the top of a skull. Mary is convinced this must be the tool maker they have been searching for. Louis. Louis, darling, please wake up. I found something very important. Darling, please, I know you're not feeling well, but try and wake up. What have you, what have you found? I don't know. That's why I want you to come oh. and have a look. So you're, gonna, you're going to have to help me. Louis Leakey has waited 20 years to find this tool-making human ancestor. Well done, my dear. You have better eyes than me. But this is not what he expected to find. The skull is more ape-like than he ever imagined. Oh, 
It's certainly not a homer, my dear, I'm afraid. Another look at this. But darling, just look at where he was found. It can't just be a coincidence. Yet it's in the same geological layer as the tools. Yes. The logic is inescapable. This must be the tool maker, and therefore the beginning of humanity. Leakey names it Zinjanthropus Boesii, after his financial sponsor, Charles Boise. It has a small brain, but massive teeth and jaws, whose muscles were so large, they had to be anchored to a ridge at the top of the skull. But if Zinj was using tools, why did it need such powerful jaws? Leakey overlooks this question and announces Zinj as the tool maker. For a year, the scientific world accepts Zinj as the tool-making missing link. Then, in 1960, Leakey completely changes his mind. Mary is on her way from the camp into town when a paint can comes dislodged in the back of her Land Rover. As she stops to fix it, she notices a familiar shape in the dirt. It's another piece of skull of an entirely new, more human-like species. Leakey decides that this, finally, is his long-lost toolmaker. He names it Homo habilis, literally, handyman. Habilis had a larger brain and much more human teeth, which made sense if he was getting meat using stone tools. Though the tools Habilis made were little more than broken rocks, they marked the very start of human stone technology. But if Habilis is the tool maker, why was Zinj also found with the tools? Leakey has stumbled across an incredible discovery, and that discovery is humans and human-like organisms coexisting in Africa at the same time. By the early 1960s, the whole model of human evolution is called into question, and with it, the very idea of a single missing link. For over a century, the model of human evolution had been a simple straight line. It began with a lower evolutionary form, an ancestral ape, and ended with the most advanced creature on Earth, the modern human being. And somewhere in the middle, there had to be a missing link between the two. So when Leakey finds Zinj, it takes pride of place, until a new candidate arrives. All of a sudden, you have Hablis, this more human-looking animal. Both these fossils date to the exact same age, about 1.8 million years of age. So what do you do? You have to remove Zinj from the human line, and you have to place them in different lines. And what is the most amazing thing, in the same valley, within meters of each other, you have two species living side by side. And that changes or makes a whole paradigm shift in how we view human evolution. And so this line is all of a sudden broken apart. Suddenly, what had been a single line of descent has been replaced by a series of lines that connect to form a giant family tree. In the years between 1925 and 1965, over a hundred hominid fossils are found and categorized in South Africa alone and they can all be placed in relation to each other by accurate dating. Some species are evolutionary dead ends, while others appear to be part of a line that leads to humans. But a number of human-like competitors occupy the Earth at the same time, with several routes to humanity. The only way to cut through the confusion is to go further back in time, 
to the root of the human family tree. Before we have a big brain, long before we use fire and language, before we even make tools, the creature everyone is looking for now marks the very beginning of humanity. November 30th, 1974. An American-led team is searching for the oldest human ancestor on Earth. And the search has a new focus, the northern end of the Rift Valley in Ethiopia. It's now possible to date rocks very accurately, so it's possible to be more precise than ever before about where to dig. Using new radiometric technology, they've dated the volcanic layers here to around three and a half million years old. Team leader is Donald Johansson, a rising star in the world of anthropology. He knows Dart's Australopithecus africanus lived over two million years ago. and Leakey's Homo habilis at about one and three quarter million, but they were on separate ancestral lines. He believes there is a common ancestor over three million years old, the same age as the surrounding rocks. Johansson's been kept away from any digging by essential paperwork. And now he's started it's a chore he's determined to finish. But his colleague, Tom Gray, returns from the site with other ideas. How's it going? Uh, actually very boring. There are areas they haven't surveyed for a while away from the main dig. You need a break? I was thinking of taking a hike out to bed three. Yeah? You wanna come? Uh, I don't know, I gotta finish this. I mean, this is pretty urgent. I gotta do something. The urge to do what he came here for finally gets the better of Johansson. Let's go. He makes a decision that will change his life. They head away from the site to explore a couple of isolated gullies. They have no idea they're just a few hundred yards from the greatest fossil find in history. But as the afternoon wears on, they have little to show for their efforts. They survey for a couple of hours. By mid-afternoon, the temperature is over 100 degrees and all they have found are a few teeth from an extinct horse and part of the skull of a pig. They decide to head back to camp. But Johansson has a hunch to look again in an old gully on their way home. Hey, Tom, this way. It's been thoroughly checked before and produce nothing. Hey man, what's up? But today, something catches Johansson's eye. Come here, Tom. A shape in the dirt that just seems too regular to be a stone. You see that? It's a fossilized arm bone. That's yes,